Well, thank you, John. That's a terrific mm -hmm. um, lead-up. And uh, it's always enormously um, good fun for me to come to America, and I particularly love coming in election year. There's so, there's so much I'd like to be asking you, actually, about this cyclical battle for power that you're now engaged in. But um, I have to talk to you instead about a different struggle for power between, as John has, as, uh, John has explained, uh, Elizabeth I of England and Mary, Queen of Scotland. This is a fascinating story on many levels. It, most simply, it's the story of the greatest rivalry one of the compelling tragedies of our history. And for many of you with your English, Irish, and Scottish um, ancestors, it's your history as much as mine. But my book, Elizabeth and Mary, is also about two very different types of women with opposing attitudes towards queenship and their own place in the world. It's a contrast in styles of leadership, a contrast in priorities, as a female monarch, was one a queen first or a woman? Ordained by God, was one detached from the people or ultimately dependent on their goodwill? The relationship between Elizabeth and Mary fascinates us even now. There are regular phone polls in Great Britain about who are the greatest Britons, and she is always in the top ten amongst Churchill, Shakespeare, Darwin, whoever. Elizabeth is always there. And there's no doubt Mrs. Thatcher saw herself as a modern Elizabeth. But um, this relationship of the Queen's has particular resonance in your election year. For Elizabeth and Mary make us think about women and power. As autocratic queens, they wielded more power than even your president does of the, over the United States. Yet, in the running for president, here and now, in this great democracy, this land of opportunity and aspiration, where are your women? This, to an outsider, is such a, a, an interesting question. Because we see American women as being the most modern of women, smashing through all sorts of glass ceilings in industry and business and the media. But it seems the top job is still closed. And it makes me wonder whether women aspiring to ultimate power, even 450 years later, whether they still have similar prejudices to overcome as Elizabeth and Mary had. And do they have almost as much to overcome in themselves too, to really believe that a woman is worthy to compete for the ultimate prize? without conforming every aspect of herself to the conventional hierarchies of power. Let's see how Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots fared with their ambitions. The story of their interconnected lives is so full of drama, it would be unbelievable as fiction. It becomes a tragedy when both queens threaten each other's lives, and one ends up executing the other. But it is this very drama that has made these complex women into caricature queens, carrying the passions and prejudices of centuries. Elizabeth as the cold, calculating Protestant virgin, and, and Mary as anything from a sexy dimwit to a murderess or a Catholic martyr. But of course they are much more complex and interesting than that. In the book, I have taken 1558 to be the pivotal year for both these queens, the point from which their ambitions for their lives were defined. 1558 was the year Mary, aged 15, already Queen of Scotland, married her French prince, the sickly boy who became Francis II of France. By becoming fleetingly Queen of France, she fulfilled all her family's highest ambitions and set her course as a woman whose destiny was linked to whom she married. She was young and she had conformed to what was automatically expected of any young princess that she make a dynastic marriage and produce at least one son and heir. 1558 was also the year when Elizabeth, aged 25, 
fulfilled her own personal ambitions and succeeded at last to her father's throne. After a long and dangerous apprenticeship, she became what she had always wanted to be, Queen of England. But from the start, she had little interest in fulfilling the next part of her dynastic duty, which was to marry a prince and assure the succession. She considered herself instead to have wedded her people. In one of her first speeches to Parliament, she stretched out her hand with her coronation ring upon her married, her married finger, and she said, when I received this ring, I solemnly bound myself in marriage to the realm, and it will be quite sufficient for the memorial of my name and my glory if when I die an inscription be engraved upon a marble tomb saying, here lieth Elizabeth, which reigned a virgin and died a virgin. This was a revolutionary decision. All her schooling, and she was a very learned young woman, pointed to the intellectual and spiritual inferiority of women. The great classical authors, she and Mary, both read, and the biblical texts, which were the bedrock of her Renaissance education, asserted time and again that it was unnatural, dangerous even, to elevate women over men. To give them power was to court disaster. If through some misfortune a state should end up with a female monarch as its head, at its head, she must marry promptly and acquire the necessary masculine hand on the tiller of the great ship of state. And then, of course, everyone could relax because it was in masculine hands again. Despite all her minister's efforts to get her to marry, the statement often reiterated by Elizabeth that she was disinclined to do so and instead had made her contract with her kingdom was one of the great secrets of her success. She never underestimated the importance of her popular following and she courted it throughout her life. She believed her people loved her and in return she made them believe that she loved them too. By remaining unmarried, of course, she risked a messy succession. She risked civil war, they feared, should she unexpectedly die. But she never diluted the emotional connection with her subjects. She claimed what were considered the masculine virtues of courage and intellect, while casting herself in the female role of mother and wife to her people. There are many eyewitness accounts of her first entry into London as queen, and they show this remarkable common touch in action. One of them reads, all her faculties were in motion and every motion seemed a well-guided action. Her eye was set upon one person. Her ear listened to another. Her judgment ran upon a third. To a fourth she addressed her speech. Her spirit seemed to be everywhere, and yet so entire in herself, as it seemed to be nowhere else. I think this shows that extraordinary combination she had of absolute majesty, because here was an autocratic queen who knew how to dress the part. She dressed to the nines. She was extraordinarily dramatic to see. And yet, in, the, in her grandest processions, her people would be shouting out to her, sometimes ribald jokes. Elizabeth had a very salty turn of, of, of phrase, and she would shout back in a way that even our modern monarchs today would ha absolutely never have that sort of casualness and informality. She was also very short-sighted, and I like to think, if any of you have seen someone you care for who's short-sighted, how close they have to hold something if they're not wearing their glasses. There's a real sort of poignancy and tenderness about it. And Elizabeth would wheel her horse in the middle of these grand processions. If she was on horseback, she'd wheel her horse, or if she was in her carriage, she'd order her her carriage driver, over to somebody who was holding out a little bunch of herbs or a plea of books, clemency or whatever, and she'd get really, really close. And so I think for those people who saw this in action, this wonderful mixture of majesty and intimacy, you, she, they never forgot it. It was a very compelling combination. <laughs> 
1558 also saw the beginning of the deadly rivalry between Elizabeth and Mary, a rivalry which would overtake them both with the inexorable force of Greek tragedy. <clears throat> On Elizabeth's accession to the throne, Mary's father-in-law, Henry II of France, claimed the English and Irish crowns as Mary's rightful inheritance. This was a direct challenge to Elizabeth, already insecure about her own legitimacy. For the Catholic powers did not recognize Henry VIII's break with Rome, his divorce from his first queen, Catherine of Aragon, and his subsequent marriage to Anne Boleyn. They considered Anne to have been merely the king's whore and Elizabeth his bastard child. They didn't mince matters in those days. Mary, Queen of Scots, on the other hand, could claim an unquestionable legitimacy. She was a great-granddaughter of Henry VII, founder of the Tudor dynasty. This rival claim to Elizabeth's throne, made concrete by her father-in-law and continually asserted by Mary herself, right to her death, propelled the tragedy of their story. The relationship between these queens was the most important of their lives. It was one relationship they did not choose and could not escape even in death. It affected them politically and personally. Blood cousins, their solidarity as rare female monarchs was undermined by their rivalry for the same throne. And yet, they never met. This was at the dramatic heart of their story, for a rival you never meet grows in the imagination, fueled by your fantasies and fears, and fed by the stories of others. In this way, a rival can become superhuman, inhuman even, and therefore easier to kill. By discussing Elizabeth and Mary in relation to each other, certain illuminating contrasts and symmetries in their lives and natures occur. They were continually compared by their ambassadors and were equally fascinated themselves by each other. Until scandal overtook her, Mary was considered the good, tractable queen, while Elizabeth was contrary, awkward, and resistant to conventional ideas of womanly duty. But the initiative kept shifting between them. Later, when Elizabeth appeared to hold all the best cards, Mary could still play those she had to devastating effect. There is so much in this book of the dynamic between them, but I can only give you two very sketchy examples, I'm afraid, in the time we have. A great fundamental difference between the queens was in their experiences of childhood and early adulthood, and how this affected their view of duty and personal happiness. Mary became the Queen of Scotland in 1542, when she was only six days old. She never knew any other condition. Aware always of her preeminence, she was proud of her status as queen. But sadly, in taking it for granted, she never truly valued what she had, nor realized it could be taken from her. At the age of six, she was sent to France to be brought up as a French princess at the center of the richest and most glamorous court in Europe. She was its beautiful, cosseted star. Intelligent, full of energy and vivacity, Mary could have been educated to be the ruler she was born to be. But instead, she was schooled to be merely the charming, accomplished consort of a French king. Her Scottish inheritance was barely valued beyond its possible usefulness in providing the back door for a French invasion of England. Her early life and her brief year as Queen of France was more about pleasure and flattery, courtly accomplishments and grand expenditure than statecraft and self-discipline. This lack of hard experience was to fatally undermine her when, in 1561, she did return to Scotland as a widow to rule her own people at last. Inexperienced, she was still only 18. We forget how young these people are. And in thrall to her powerful nobles, she lacked the necessary authority and the tools to assert her will. She expected to be loved, 
and relied and had relied so far on her extraordinary mixture of beauty and charismatic charm to get her what she needed. She learnt too late the lessons of kingship. Elizabeth, on the other hand, was neglected rather than spoilt. In a review in England, Sir Roy Strong points out that Elizabeth is the sort of Cinderella figure compared to Mary's pampered princess in all this. Elizabeth had to endure great reversals of fortune in her youth, disinherited by her father, that's the old monster Henry VIII, of course, and then reinstated as one of his heirs again before he died. But even at the best of times, as a child, she was only ever third in line to the throne. Becoming queen was never a certainty. During the Wyatt Rebellion in 1554, when Elizabeth was only 20 years old, she was imprisoned in the terrifying Tower of London by her sister, Mrs. Bloody Mary, Mary I, and under threat of death. She had learned very early how best to conduct herself, how much her fate was in her own hands, how unpredictable was life and monarchy, how much the support of the people mattered. Isolated and disregarded as a girl, she decided that watchfulness and equivocation was safer than spontaneity and reckless action. Despite the differences in their childhood experiences, both Elizabeth and Mary Queen of Scots had remarkable mothers who for different reasons were lost to them. History anyway is not good at giving credit to the women, to the mothers. Anne Boleyn was an intellectual woman who had radical Protestant sympathies. She was courageous and spirited, but she was executed when Elizabeth was not yet three, and so was never known to her daughter. It, is also dangerous for, it was also dangerous for Elizabeth to be allied in any way with a mother who'd been accused of treason, incest, and witchcraft. So memory even was denied her. In public, it was to her father's memory that Elizabeth allied herself, compared herself, and yet in private, she showed protectiveness towards her mother's name and loyalty to her Berlin family. There exists a ring where there's a, a, a hidden compartment which has a portrait of um, Elizabeth and a portrait of her mother face to face. So it's nice to think that she honored her mother, if only in private. Similarly, Mary's mother was lost to her too. A French noblewoman, Mary of Guise, was her daughter's regent in Scotland and as an intelligent and redoubtable ruler, was an excellent role model, model for her daughter. But sadly, Mary and her mother were separated and never really knew each other. For Mary of Guise stayed on in Scotland to safeguard her daughter's inheritance and Mary, growing up in France, pursued her dynastic d destiny there. They only met one more time, and Mary never had a chance to see her mother's careful rule. She knew better her mother's family in France, the Guise, who were a band of charismatic and powerful brothers, very influential in court and in Mary's life. And in some respects, they're very like the young Kennedys. They were extremely glamorous, they were very tall, actually much taller than the Kennedys, um, and they were perhaps the Kennedys with knobs on because the Duke of Guise, who was the eldest, was a stupendous military commander that even his enemies thought was just brilliant. And of course the younger brother was the Cardinal of Lorraine, so they had church and army tied up in Guise hands. But these glamorous uncles reinforced her early experiences that men were the executive force in a world made for men. Probably the most significant contrast between Elizabeth and Mary came with their differing responses to the challenge of having a favorite accused of murder. Elizabeth faced this first, only two years into her reign. She was at the height of her love affair with Lord Robert Dudley. He later became the Earl of Leicester, and was possibly even toying with the romance of marrying him. His young wife, Amy Robsart, was found dead at the bottom of a very short flight of stairs. Her neck was broken. Although Lord Robert was nowhere near the scene of death at the time, 
Rumour immediately implicated him with her murder. He was already disliked for his overweening ambition mm. and his obvious desire to marry the Queen. The scandal gathered so much force it threatened to taint Elizabeth too. She recognised immediately that she could not afford any shadow to fall on her reputation. As a popular but insecure queen, she could not risk alienating her people. She banished Lord Robert to his country estate. She initiated the legal inquiry, which of course exonerated him, and he was quickly back in her favour. But she knew from that moment that her people and her nobility would not allow her to marry him, even should she wish to. And we're not certain that she necessarily did, although he was the love of her life. Interestingly, Mary faced exactly the same dilemma, but chose a quite different course from which all the calamities of her life then flowed. Her second husband, Lord Donnelly, was murdered in 1567, after her rapid marriage to him had rapidly turned sour. The man who seemed to dominate her affections at the time, the Earl of Bothwell, was also the main suspect in the King's murder. There was immediate popular outrage against them both. Elizabeth seemed to be less exercised as to whether her cousin was guilty or not of complicity in her husband's murder, but she did care passionately about Mary's reputation and by association the fragile reputation of all queens. Rec recognizing the danger of her cousin's situation, she, she writes the most urgent sisterly letter of advice. And she writes in French because, of course, that was Mary's natural language by, by, by now, and she didn't want her to miss any nuance. Madam, she writes, my ears have been so deafened and my understanding so grieved and my heart so affrighted to hear the dreadful news of the abominable murder of your mad husband and my killed cousin. <laughs> She's referring, of course, to um, Darnley, who was a cousin both to Elizabeth and to Mary. But it's, it's, I think, wonderful that he's your mad husband and my killed cousin, that I scarcely have the wits to write about it. I exhort you, I counsel you, and I beseech you to take this thing so much to heart that you will not fear to touch even him whom you have nearest to you. She means Bothwell that no persuasion will prevent you from making an example out of this to the whole world that you are both a noble princess and a loyal wife. Mary was outraged, she should be so patronised by this <laughs> elder cousin, and, uh, but both of them knew that the world was watching, and I mean, by the world I mean Europe. Um, it was Mary's tragedy that she not only ignored this good advice, but she defiantly married the man. After a show trial had done nothing more than stoke the fury against them. Posters in the streets of Edinburgh denounced Bothwell as a murderer and Mary in the guise of a mermaid as his whore. The threat of civil war, her resultant imprisonment, forced abdication, escape and exile all followed from this folly. But throughout her life, Mary was capable of great physical courage and adventurousness that amazed even her contemporaries, even the tough old Scots. When her blood was up, she was game for any enterprise and was much more impetuously bellicose than Elizabeth. On more than one occasion, she rode with her men, booted and spurred like them, some said in male clothing and with a pistol tucked into her saddle. She was also recklessly emotional in her judgments. Even in her first miserable imprisonment in the middle of Loch Leven, Mary refused to denounce Bothwell, reported as declaring, she will live and die with him. If it were put to her choice, she would leave her kingdom and dignity to live as a simple damoiselle with him and that she will never consent that he shall fare worse or have more harm than herself. To a romantic and modern sensibility, this is an admirable sentiment. But to a pragmatist like Elizabeth, 
who passionately believed that a queen was elevated to her preeminent role by God and owed her crown every care. Such reckless disregard with, for her position and sacred duty was contemptible. Mary's eventual escape from Loch Leven brought her to England. To flee to England instead of to France was another of her disastrous emotional decisions. It placed both her and Elizabeth in an impossible situation. There began the last long and dangerous act of the tragedy of these two queens, Mary's 17 years of confinement in various northern castles turned into as much of a bondage for Elizabeth as it was for her prisoner. I am not free, Elizabeth said on one occasion. I am a captive too. Mary had desperately sought refuge and help from Elizabeth to reclaim her Scottish throne. But Elizabeth could neither force the Scottish lords to take her back as queen nor could she allow her to go into exile in France. Her claim on Elizabeth's throne was too powerful to give her freedom of action in such hostile territory. And yet, Elizabeth knew that there was something oppressive and illegal in keeping her fellow queen prisoner. However duplicitous Elizabeth may be, it mattered to her that she at least had appeared to be honorable and above all, just. Mary's prodigious energies now became focused on dreams of rescue and plots for escape. She also spent quite a lot of time doing very aggressive embroidery. If any of you have seen some of it, it's emblems which showed Elizabeth in a very bad light, either as an extremely cross tabby cat playing with a mouse, which was meant to be Mary, or a wonderful pillow that she embroiders for the Duke of Norfolk when she's hoping he's going to marry her and spring her to freedom in one of the many plots where she's got a vine that has a two branches. One is fruitful and one is barren. And she embroiders this hand with a pruning sickle, cutting off the barren, the barren vine. So um, obviously exhorting Norfolk to go and do his duty and destroy Elizabeth and put the fruitful Mary in her place. These plots increasingly involve the dispatch, even the destruction of Elizabeth and the replacement of the Protestant queen with the Catholic Mary on her English throne. Mary became the focus for any discontent at home and for foreign interests hostile to Elizabeth abroad. As the English Queen's life seemed increasingly imperiled, she was under mounting pressure, begged by her lords to do away with this troublesome prisoner. It's really interesting. There are at least two occasions when they, they, they write that the lords have tears coursing down their cheeks as they beg Elizabeth to do something. And uh, they're obviously concerned for her life and obviously concerned also for themselves and the status quo. But only with <coughs> incontrovertible proof could they persuade Elizabeth to act. When Sir Francis Walsingham set a trap for Mary, she leapt into it with both feet. In what became known as the Babington Plot, the last great plot of her career, the letters between Mary and a young Catholic zealot, Anthony Babington, were intercepted and deciphered. The invasion of England by Spain, the uprising of disaffected English Catholics, the assassination of Elizabeth and installation of Mary as the next Queen of England was all part of the lurid plan that Mary enthusiastically endorsed. While out stag hunting with her jailer, Mary saw a group of horsemen come over the brow of a distant hill. Her heart leapt. Here were the long-promised conspirators who would spring her to freedom at last. Her despair and fear on realizing that instead they were Elizabeth's commissioners, come to arrest her on the capital charge of treason, <coughs> marked the low point from which she would arise set on redemption. She was not to show any real public dismay again. Mary never accepted any responsibility or knowledge even of the plots against Elizabeth's throne or life. She maintained her claim that she was persecuted for her religion alone. She had determined that she would die not as a conspirator in treason, but as a martyr for her faith. She conducted herself throughout the trial with haughty composure. She and Elizabeth were locked in a battle for the moral high ground. 
She defended herself with great intelligence and assurance and received her sentence of death with an ecstatic expression. A contemporary described her lifting her hands and eyes up to heaven and giving God thanks for it, rejoicing in her heart that she was taken to be an instrument for the re-establishing of religion in these islands. This disconcerted and enraged Elizabeth, who was struggling herself with the terrible responsibility of having to sign her cousin's death warrant. She feared the morality of it, of a queen killing a fellow queen. Even more, she feared the political consequences. England was still an impoverished, small nation surrounded by the much more powerful and prosperous Catholic powers of Spain and France. What vengeance would be unleashed by this act of regicide? Elizabeth feared she might even lose Scotland's precious neutrality on her vulnerable northern border. To the French ambassador, who had come to plead for clemency, Elizabeth burst out with, it is impossible to save my own life if I preserve that of the Queen of Scots. But if you ambassadors can point out any means whereby I may do it, consistent with my own security, I shall be greatly obliged to you, never having shed so many tears at the death of my father, of my brother King Edward, of my sister Mary, as I have done for this unfortunate affair. The relationship now had its own momentum that meant that for one queen to live, the other had to die. It was Mary who went to her death in the co dark cold month of February, 1587. She was 44. She conducted herself with nobility and a terrific sense of theater. By insisting she was a martyr, not a traitor, she not only rescued her reputation from the wreckage of her life, she quickly entered the realms of sainthood and mythology. As her star shot heavenwards, Elizabeth plummeted. In guilt and fear, the English queen turned on her immediate ministers and accused them of having tricked her into signing the death warrant. She blamed everyone. She ranted and railed and threatened with imprisonment, banishment, even death. Then she slipped into a melancholic depression. Mary's death was the nadir of Elizabeth's life but it also became the means by which she rose, phoenix-like, to become our greatest queen, Elizabeth as Gloriana. The catalyst for this transformation was the long-feared aggression of Spain. During the previous years, the Spanish had been diligent, diligently amassing their great armada. Now, with Mary's death, Philip II was propelled at last into vengeful action against England. The following summer of 1588, a great Spanish fleet was heading for the coast, intent on invasion. An eyewitness report of the magnificent and terrifying sight is so eloquent and such a brilliant example, I think, of the best of Elizabethan prose that I thought I'd read you a tiny bit of it. The Armada consisted of 130 ships and called by the arrogant name of Invincible. The galleons with lofty turrets like castles were spread out before us in a crescent, spreading for about seven miles. They were sailing very slowly, though with full sails, the winds being, as it were, tired with carrying them, and the ocean groaning under the weight of them. It's such a brilliant image of those top-heavy, massive boats and the slow progress they made because they were so heavy. In fact, the weather, good luck, small, fast English ships and cheeky seamanship managed to disperse this great threat. Elizabeth was asked by Lord Robert Dudley, now the Earl of Leicester, to address the troops who were waiting to repel any invaders at Tilbury, which is near the mouth of the Thames. And of course, the Thames was the great river that would lead them straight up to London and the heart of power. She rode among her men wearing a breastplate of steel, it was said. Some said it was gold. Perhaps there was no breastplate at all, but that is how they saw their warrior queen. Here she gave the greatest speech of her life, and it's one of the most compelling speeches in the English language. In England, we grew up with it, and I'm sure many of you know it, but it's a tiny bit again that I can give you because of time, but it's... Um, 
It's rather, again, rather wonderful Elizabethan prose. My loving people, she began, let tyrants fear. I have so behaved myself that under God, I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. She's calling in all those years of loyalty from queen to people and people to queen. Wherefore I am come among you at this time, but for my recreation and pleasure, being resolved in the midst and heat of battle to live and die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and for my people, mine honor and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too. Now, she had no speech writers. She had no spin doctors, but she was brilliant at propaganda, and her best speeches were pretty quickly printed and distributed. And it's nice to think that perhaps Shakespeare, who was uh, starting out in his career, might have read one of those crumpled bits of paper in the dust and been inspired. So the transfiguration of both queens was complete. Through the tragedy of her death, Mary had become the noble and saintly queen, and thereby erased the shadows of the murder of her husband, the loss of her son, the discarding of her kingdom, the complicity in treason against her cousin queen. And by, and by becoming a warrior queen, Elizabeth managed to cast off the habit of her two-faced indecision and the trauma of having killed a fellow queen. Through action, she had transformed herself into the great monarch she had always wanted to be. At Elizabeth's own death in 1603, 400 years ago, the contrary ambitions of these two remarkable queens were united at last with the accession to Elizabeth's precious throne of Mary's son, James VI of Scotland. As James I of England, he ruled over a united and Protestant Great Britain, representing both Stuart and Tudor ideals.